Welcome Welcome in the language of the Yagara people. We acknowledge the Turrbal and Yagara peoples as the first nation owners of the lands of where QUT now stands. For thousands of years, the Turrbal and Yagara people have gathered along the banks of Maywa, the Brisbane River, to share their knowledge and stories. We pay our respects to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. We recognize that these lands where QUT now stands have always been places of teaching, researching and learning. We acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within our QUT community. From Moreton Bay inland as far as the Great Dividing Range near Warwick and Toowoomba, as far north as the Caboolture River, including the lands around Brisbane City, Mianjin. Yura yura yinala, balka bi balka, nangura ngura maramakura nganyabirali nganyabayam. Welcome to the traditional country of the Turrbal and Yagara people. Thank you. I'd also like to add my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land where QT stands, our people of the Turrbal and the Yagara Nations, and pay my respects to our elders, past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to welcome and acknowledge our special guests this evening. So we have uh, from the Queensland Government, Minister for Tourism, Innovation and Sport, the Honourable Sterling Hinchley, MP. We also have QUT's Vice Chancellor and President, Professor Margaret Sheil Aoni, and we have the Queensland Government Director General, Department of State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning, Mr. Mike Kaiser. Uh, we have from our colleagues at MIT, um, MIT's David Sarnoff, Professor of Management, Professor Scott Stern. MIT Sloan School of Management Assistant Dean Global Programs, Mr. David Capitolupo. And we have um, from MIT Sloan School of Management Senior Director Global Programs, Mr. Stu Crossell. Stu, oh, it's over there. <laughs> and MIT Senior Lecturer uh, Technological Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Strategic Management, Dr. Aaron Scott. Thank you. Uh, and we have um, Emeritus Professor uh, Arun Sharma here this evening. And we have QT's Pro Vice Chancellor Entrepreneurship, Professor Rowena Barrett. Welcome. And we'll be hearing from Rowena a little shortly. Uh, we have um, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Creative Industries and Education and Social Justice, Professor Laurie Lockyer. And we have um, Professor Michael Roseman, who is the Director of the Centre for Future Enterprise. Welcome. And the Deputy Dean for the Faculty of Business and Law, Professor Cameron Newton, and our Head of the Graduate School of Business, Professor Sarah Kelly. And it's, it's Sarah's house that we're in this afternoon, so thank you, Sarah. Uh, this afternoon, we also have our special panel speakers. So we have Cisco's Managing Director for Public Sector and Strategic Initiatives, Mr. Sam Gurner. Welcome, Sam. We have QIC Operating Partner, Mr. Wayne Gerard. Thank you. Uh, Logan City Council City Transformation Program Lead, Georgie Major. Welcome. Uh, Soconomy Founder and Chief Evangelist, now there's a title, Yaz Grigalinas, welcome. Cisco's Regional Director, Queensland, Northern Territory and Papua New Guinea, Mr. Terry Weber. And members of the National Industry Innovation Network, Erin Stacey and Jeff Jones. And of course, colleagues, guests and friends, Welcome! That was a long list. <laughs> you can see that it's a, it's a terrific um, turn up that we have this afternoon. So it's my absolute delight to welcome you to today's MIT QUT Live discussion, Building Innovative Ecosystems. My name is Amanda Goodmanson and I am the Executive Dean for the Faculty of Business and Law and I'll be your MC this afternoon. 
So today will be an inspiring and intellectual discussion, bringing together academic and industry leaders from QUT's partners, MIT Sloan School of Management, our industry partner, Cisco, and our Queensland government and local innovation ecosystem partners. We're delighted that you could all join us here this afternoon. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce QUT's Vice Chancellor and President, Professor Margaret Scheel Ao. Professor Scheel is QUT's Vice Chancellor uh, and a renowned chemist. She is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Academy of Technology Engineering, and the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. I now invite Professor Scheel to the stage to provide the official welcome. Um, thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, Given that long line of acknowledgements, I won't add too many, though I did notice uh, Mike Kaiser here as Director General from Department of State Development Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. You really did need to work on the names of these departments, <laughs> so, um, as well as uh, the many people that Amanda has already acknowledged. I too uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Turrbal and the Agro people. And this is a very important week, week in uh, the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia. It's NAIDOC week, which celebrates their history and culture and their Aboriginal excellence. So particularly, um, and the theme of NAIDOC week is, is respect elders. So I particularly pay my respect to the elders who have uh, preserved that culture over 65,000 years here in Australia and celebrated. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to join the Minister, colleagues from MIT, Scott and David and others, uh, representatives from our key partners, Cisco, QIC, Economy, and, and Logan City Council. And I understand you've had a busy morning out of Logan already and uh, with the Mayor and the Queensland Connects Cohort 3 team and I'm proud of a raging success. Strong partnerships that, such as that between MIT and QUT require champions on each side. And the QUT-MIT partnership was championed initially by the then DVCR, now Professor Emeritus, uh, Distinguished Professor Emeritus QT's Arun Sharma. It's wonderful that Arun was able to join us today. He uh, encouraged uh, Rowena into the, uh, from her role in the management in the School of Management to take on uh, the stewardship of entrepreneurship uh, here at QUT. And so Rowena Barrett is now a Pro Vice Chancellor of Entrepreneurship, and she's really been Pivotal, pivotal to fostering that partnership and the reprogram more generally. And Rowena has had strong support from her current dean, Amanda Goodmanson, and, her, and Amanda's predecessor, Professor Rowena Xavier, who's now our DVC academic here at QUT. In what seems like a lifetime ago, Minister, in 2018, we had the pleasure of jointly hosting a visit from a visiting member of the British royal family who shall remain nameless um, <laughs> in our government house. And I was reflecting on that, I often reflect on that when I see the minister, um, but um, it, as I was describing to that member of the royal family, the history of QUT is an institution which formed from the merger of QIT, Queensland Institute of Technology, which in turn was founded about the same um, followed um, its founding institution was Brisbane School of the Arts, uh, and which had a very similar mission to, to, Q, to Q, uh, MIT when it was founded. And then Q, QIT, together with the Colleges of Advanced Education, merged to form QUT in, in 1989. And um, that our visitor that day said, why didn't you stay with QIT as the name? Because from everything I had described to him, uh, we were positioned within the Australian ecosystem in the same way as MIT was in the US, which was a, a, a great compliment. Um, and uh, that no one doubts MIT standing as a university despite not having the U in the name. But we've persisted with the U in the name. Um, but the, and the observation that there is much in common between MIT and QUT does reflect our sh shared commitment to providing practical and relevant education connected to and responding to the needs of te new technologies, um, responding to new technologies and the needs of industry and business, underpinned by research and education that has got a very strong founding in excellence and quality. So the partnership has enabled our QUT entrepreneur students to participate in the MIT, MIT FUSE uh, program each January. 
60, why you blame Queensland to get Boston in January, I'm not sure, but um, uh, uh, I'm sure it's a wonderful experience. 60 QT MBAs attended two week immersion to MIT each year, and in October, a small band, a uh, small number of your MIT MBAs will be hosted here in Brisbane to work on an entrepreneurial project. A QUT staff member spends up to six months at MIT as an international faculty fellow each year. And we collaborate on the Future Enterprise webinar series, which was initially set up to supplement our relationship when travel was not possible during COVID and has seen the global audience of more than 4,000 now from over 40 countries since 2021. Innovation is a core value of QUT and entrepreneurship, which we support through QUT Entrepreneurship led by Rowena Barrett and the Business Development Portfolio led by Vice President Mark Harvey is a pillar of our strategy, has been for some time, and we recently refreshed that with our QUT Connection Strategy. Innovation and entrepreneurship is embedded in informal award programs, in the development of new diploma and bachelor level programs, in a range of units across the faculties, in badge non-award programs and workshops, in our work uh, in regional Queensland ecosystem development, and in mentoring and public events such as this one. Rowena Barrett and her team have helped more than 22,000 students participate in extracurricular entrepreneurship events during the past three years. That's a huge number of them. Um, and we provide through QUT Entrepreneurship 18 budding entrepreneur scholarships of 8,000 a year, and that for three years have been offered up since 2020. And we've supported programs that have spawned more than 100 student led startups. With advanced Queensland support, and thank you, Minister Hinchcliffe, they have assisted regions across Queensland to build innovation ecosystems in the Queensland Connect program. And I know some of you here will be flying to Longreach tomorrow at, or on July 1st, 4th to work together uh, on innovation to enable th that disaster resilience in our state. And we do have our fair share of natural disasters and I wish you well. Um, they've connected to the entrepreneurial teams at MIT and um, really been uh, the bedrock of this very important collaboration. So these and other initiatives with staff in the faculties and division have led to QUT uh, just last week being named Entrepreneurial University of the Year for the Asia Pacific region. <laughs> so well done team and that was in Barcelona and uh, uh, Rowena's colleague, uh, Glenn Murphy, accepted that award on our behalf. Uh, QT has, since 89, built, progressively built a global reputation, so we're now ranked amongst the top 200 universities in the world. Um, so we've probably got about 100 Nobel Prizes to go before we can reach anywhere near MIT's <laughs> world ranking. No pressure on our researchers. Um, we do know that all successful global innovation hubs have leading universities as part of the ecosystem, educating students with the skills and an entrepreneurial mindship, mindset and facilitating opportunities for our academics to exchange knowledge to develop and commercialise intellectual property within that ecosystem. So I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion on building innovation ecosystems as part of this series. Any scientist who studied ecosystem also knows that there are many codependent variables and they must have ongoing nourishment. And uh, for that, we are uh, very grateful to the support that has been provided by the Queensland Government. So it's with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce Minister Hindcliffe and thank him and the Government for their ongoing support of this ecosystem, not just in major centres, but right across the state. The Honourable Sterling Hinchcliffe MP is the Member for Sandgate and the Minister for Tourism, Innovation and Sport and the Minister assisting the Premier on Olympics and Paralympic Sport and Engagement. You must have the best portfolio in government. <laughs> it's all the fun stuff. Um, and so his responsibilities do include entrepreneurship, innovation and major events and I'm delighted to welcome him to address us today. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Margaret, and uh, um, can I uh, join you in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we gather today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And uh, in that acknowledgement, acknowledge that they, uh, that those communities are the first innovators in this country and that uh, 
we stand in a in an opportunity to, to capitalise upon those traditions and those values and those opportunities to be further innovating for good outcomes for our community and for the world. Uh, now, uh, Amanda, I think you, you covered everyone who needs to be acknowledged. Um, so to all those professors, you know who you are, um, and to all the others who are contributing to uh, uh, this partnership and the opportunities that it represents, it's, it's terrific to join you here today at this live event uh, with the, the Queensland University of Technology and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, this uh, Future Enterprise Global uh, webinar series has returned for the first time this year and here it is, live on stage, live, it's live. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Scott, that was something that uh, was a great opportunity to celebrate, uh, to bring us all back together. Um, and what a great way to jump back into action as we finally put to so many of those restrictions that the global pandemic uh, presented to us behind us. Um, but we're here today to celebrate uh, innovation, entrepreneurship and investment. And here in Queensland, we know innovation is key to the driving real economic growth for our state. Uh, our state's innovation initiative is Advance Queensland, and it represents a, a major investment by our government in a strong future for uh, the state's economy. And I, I want to thank uh, the, the Vice-Chancellor for uh, her acknowledgement of the role that Advance Queensland plays. Uh, launched in 2015, Advance Queensland is a whole of innovation ecosystem initiative, which supports the creation, scale-up, and international success of Queensland innovators, researchers, scientists, and businesses. Since its inception, it's engaged close to 8,000 innovators in more than 140 different programs, which in turn have resulted in over 27,000 jobs throughout our state. And this has leveraged more than $1 billion in funds from the private sector, from investors and partners. Advanced Queensland is now capitalising on our success so far and working towards even further economic growth opportunities for our community. Key advanced uh, Queensland initiatives include uh, Deadly Innovation Strategy, which is about creating economic pathways for Queensland's First Nations people, the innovators and businesses. It's enabled us to harness the unique wisdom and experience, as I said, of our country's ancient cultures, the oldest continuing cultures on earth and to see contemporary First Nations entrepreneurs achieve real business success. Regional Futures is another initiative which enables innovation beyond our capital city and metropolitan areas, which is essential in a vast and decentralised state like Queensland. We're harnessing entrepreneurial partnerships to grow sustainable rural and regional economies through collaboration, networks and shared capability across all domains of the ecosystem. Science, research, business, academia, government and community. We're also investing in precincts and places to provide the dedicated innovation infrastructure across the state, including specialist tech hubs in artificial intelligence, extended reality, ag tech and logistics. And in the state budget, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we backed female founders with an additional uh, $5 million to support opportunities for women in innovation. So what does the future look like for Queensland Innovation? Well, last year we released a new 10-year roadmap, Innovation for a Future Economy 2022-2032, to take us through to the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. It sets out six strategies for our vision for Queensland as a leading and sustainable world-class innovation economy. These include greater investment attraction, more innovative business starting, growing and staying in, Brisbane, in, in Queensland. Our, st our state's world-class research translated into commercial opportunities. Ensuring Queensland's existing and emerging priorities and talent are globally competitive. And our ecosystem is thriving, connected and inclusive. Now we're aware of the reality facing Queensland, which, like the rest of the world, is going to be impacted by ongoing cooling of venture capital. Uh, in response to that, the Palaszczuk government has established Queensland Venture Capital Development Fund to support early stage businesses to unlock some $150 million. We not only want our state's growing entrepreneurial ecosystem to retain startups, but also attract high-performing startups because we know they are proven job creators 
increasing employment at faster rates than other sectors. But innovation isn't just about government support and capital investment. It's also about partnership and collaboration. And what a great example we've got of it uh, uh, here today. The work between uh, MIT and QUT is an outstanding example of that sort of partnership and collaboration. In 2019, QUT Business School embarked on that collaboration with MIT Sloan, which solely focused on an innovative immersion program for QUT MBA and Executive MBA students. The plan was to enhance QUT's entrepreneurship program with access to MIT's global entrepreneurial networks, and this is certainly being achieved. I am very much looking forward to hearing uh, these uh, world-renowned uh, experts talk today about business leadership, transformation and entrepreneurship and how they got where they are. My department has also collaborated with uh, QUT to establish the Queensland Connects program, uh, which the Vice Chancellor has been kind enough to mention. It is the very manifestation of this priority for a connected, productive, innovative innovation ecosystem. Proudly adapted from the world-renowned MIT Regional Entrepreneur Acceleration Program framework, the REAP framework, uh, Queensland Connect sees leaders, including researchers, investors, entrepreneurs, industry and government, join forces to form teams around a shared local challenge or opportunity. Then they develop collaborative initiatives to shift the dial, to unlock economic potential and jobs for their regions. I recently uh, toured the program's long-term legacy in action. As part of the Queensland Connects, a team from the Gold Coast Health and Knowledge Precinct has worked on a vision and initiatives to drive the transformation of what was the 2018 Commonwealth Games Athletes Village into an emerging health and innovation hub with, global, with a global reputation for high-tech industry development, research collaboration and future jobs. One of our current Queensland Connects cohort is engaging in some very exciting must-win battles. The team in Ipswich is exploring an intriguing sounding community energy grid. The team in Logan is developing a refugee entrepreneurship uh, program. And Team Townsville is creating a tech simulation and testing environment. Now our panel members know a thing or two about the importance of uh, keeping and attracting good talent. So we, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from Yaz, from Circle Economy, from Wayne, from Red Eye, uh, who both received advanced uh, Queensland support that's helped their businesses grow from strength to strength. But they've also both been incredible <coughs> champions and advocates for Queensland innovation and its economic and social potential. And I want to thank them both for that. We all know that the future is bright for Queensland. We have the talent, the skills and drive, and I'd like to think a government with a vision and commitment to innovation and entrepreneurship as well. So thank you very much to both QUT and MIT for this opportunity to speak with you today. And I really look forward to hearing from the panel. Uh, it's a great opportunity to celebrate what your partnership has added to the outstanding uh, uh, innovation ecosystem here in Queensland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. The continued partnership between the Queensland Government and QUT for entrepreneurship and innovation is greatly appreciated and continues to help us, as you say, unlock the opportunity to build thriving innovation ecosystems. And to that end, I'd like to now um, introduce Prof uh, Professor Rowena Barrett, Pro Vice Chancellor of Entrepreneurship. So as um, Professor Scheel let everybody know, um, we are the Entrepreneurial University of the Year for the Asia Pacific. Now that's obviously a recognition that we are very proud of and we continue to be committed uh, to building entrepreneurial thinkers and doers at QUT. Professor Barrett leads QUT Entrepreneurship, providing all of our students and staff with opportunities, programs and facilities to build an entrepreneurial mindset and to ignite ideas to realise resources beyond existing means. Professor Barrett is a widely recognised academic in managing people and entrepreneurial teams. Uh, Professor Barrett is the Chair of the Queensland Government's Innovation Advisory Council, uh, 
leads and works with members of the Department of Tourism, Innovation and Sport to the Queensland Connects, the regional ecosystem that Minister was just referring to, uh, and leadership program with Dr Charlene McLennan. In 2018, um, Rowena was instrumental in, find, in founding the MIT QUT partnership. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Rowena Barrett to the stage, and she will lead us in a stimulating and inspiring panel discussion. Thank you very much, Amanda. And Thank you also to Margaret and the Minister for all their kind words about the work that we do. You know, it's always a pleasure to do good work and doing good work gives you pleasure. And this is what it is for me, working at QUT. Can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Turrbal and the Yagara, and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging, particularly knowing it's NAIDOC week with for our elders being the theme where we have our own innovation, which shouldn't be that hard. Uh, we have our own innovation here at QUT in that we have an elder in residence and Uncle Chegg provides us guidance and wisdom to help us engage with our Indigenous community. And for that, we're really grateful we will be retiring very shortly, but we're really grateful for that and look forward to our next Elder in Residence. So tonight we're here to talk about innovation ecosystems and generally the interest that we have in supporting and understanding innovation ecosystems pertains to their potential contribution to economic development and to regional growth through that entrepreneurial action that leverages innovation. Innovation can be never been seen before, new to the world, no one, no one knows what it is. It can be at that end, new to the world. Innovation can also be new to me, something that makes my job better, something that makes our community work better, something that helps us come together and engage better. So leveraging that innovation is incredibly important. So an ecosystem is being defined as a set of interdependent actors and factors that are coordinated in such a way that they enable productive entrepreneurship in a particular territory. And so tonight we have five key stakeholders in the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem on the panel. So we have in order, if we can come up please, uh, <laughs> Professor Scott Stern, who you've met to date. Not only does he understand innovation ecosystems, he understands the role that universities play in innovation ecosystems, but he's also the architect of one of the architects of the MIT Regional Entrepreneurship Acceleration Program. <laughs> Wayne Gerard is currently the operating partner with QIC, the Queensland government owned investment corporation with about $92 billion under management. Um, but many of us know him as a leading entrepreneur. He was Queensland's fourth chief entrepreneur. He's also the co founder of Red Eye as well. So, Wayne. <laughs> Sam Berner works for Cisco, one of our close corporate partners here at QUT, and works for, I think, is a bit of a misnomer. I think he lives and breathes in technology and telecommunications, and he's been with Cisco for 30 years. So I think he's in for the long haul. So he must have started when he was five. <laughs> Sam is the Managing Director of Public Sector and Strategic Industries. He's flown up from Melbourne to join us today. George Major is a really good friend of ours at QUT and a member of the Queensland Connects team in Logan. She's the Acting City Transformation Program Lead. And if you haven't stopped in Logan lately on your way down to the Gold Coast, do. This is where we have a one of the very few unicorns that exist in Australia at Go One. We have the most extraordinary innovations going on there. A passionate mayor who is bringing change to the city. 
There is so much going on. You're missing a trick if you just continue down that M1 without <laughs> stopping. Georgie. And I think finally, you've probably been living under a rock if you don't know our final uh, <laughs> guest on the panel, but Yasmin Grigalenis is one of Queensland's leading entrepreneurs. Through initially through the Profit for Purpose World's Biggest Garage Sale. Many people will know that. Recently rebranded as Seconomy, Yaz has single-handedly brought the uh, circular economy into our vernacular. We know what it is, we know what it does, and gee, she, she does amazing work. So through our conversation, you'll learn a little bit more about our panellists and we're going to keep moving fairly rapidly through some questions here. And you think of questions too, you'll have time to, to ask them. So Wayne, starting with you, how would you describe the innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem we have here in Queensland? G'day everyone, it's so great to be here. Thanks all for turning up. And thanks to those people that are online, it's super excited to have such interest in our innovation ecosystem. How would I describe it, Rowena? I'd say it is on fire. And it's on fire from the tip of Queensland down to the border of New South Wales and out west as well. We've uh, got so many great things happening and I'm sure a lot of people have seen and heard about the work that uh, we're doing with Queensland Connects and all of the regions that are actively taking ownership over their opportunity and the potential to innovate in their region in a way that's relevant and sensible for them. It's super exciting. Thank you. Yes. And Yaz, you're one of these overnight successes. You just, you know, came in from nowhere. <laughs> we know an overnight success takes many, many years of hard work to build. What changes have you seen here in the ecosystem in the time that you've been building your business? Excellent question. It's actually 10 years this month for World's Biggest Garage Sale's first event, which yep. was a humble little garage sale in Wavell. Um, for the first few years, it was a it was a once a year event that I just whacked together in my annual leave of, of the previous company I worked at. And by the third event, when we raised almost 100 grand, I thought, <coughs> holy moly, this is a business. But I wanted it to be a profit for purpose business, a social enterprise where we could make money and make a difference. And I, I remember the first day I met the ecosystem at River City Labs, back when Peter Ellis was the CEO. And uh, Steve Baxter said, what the hell are you doing here? You're not a tech company. <laughs> and I said, not yet. I said, but I've got more revenue and customers than all of the other applicants put together. So I'm gonna figure out the tech along the way. And so what I feel has changed is that we've seen a lot more tech companies who have hardware or products or, or services that are not necessarily algorithms and software. Uh, and what we've seen is a, a significant acceptance of the differences of how entrepreneurs show up. I was a female founder in my 40s, unapologetically bullish, confident, capable, back myself and social enterprise, world's biggest garage sale, there is not one box I fit into <laughs> back then, which is why when Seconomy was created as a brand, and Wayne, you were one of the first people I told about it, Seconomy was just circular economy mashed together as a word, of course, um, registered in 2018, and I almost changed it to come into the accelerator. But I was already all of these weird things. I thought trying to pitch my pants off for Seconomy wouldn't make as much sense as World's Biggest Garrison. And it was Terry and his team at Cisco, Data3 and others who escalated our business because of partnerships, which of course is one of the SDGs. And that's what I've seen as well. A an abundance of diversity, an acceptance of difference, and the SDGs front and center of businesses building as a force for good. Yeah, fantastic, thank you, yes. Sam, tell me, with a corporate like Cisco, what can you bring to the ecosystem? What does a corporate bring to the ecosystem? You mean apart from that sweet Silicon Valley money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, actually, I mean, I've been at Cisco not quite 30 years. I think I've been in the IT industry that long, but um, 24 years. <laughs> Cisco's a, um, a network that's a world's leader in 
in uh, technology, but there's a meta context um, with such access to global markets and such present in, in so many industries, whether it's private or public sector. Uh, what we bring is the world. So we bring the world to the partnerships that we uh, participate in. I've recently just come back from a, a trip to a couple of your colleagues, uh, Copenhagen and Oslo, talking about sustainability, talking about innovation. Um, and the access that I have through my organisation to the world, I, I can bring a very local way uh, to here in Queensland, I think. That's something that Cisco has been able to do very well, and not least of which because we're a networking company and it's in our DNA. Yeah, absolutely. Let's chat after this. <laughs> <laughs> and Georgie, you're with local government, and all levels of government play a role in the ecosystem. Uh, and you play, local government plays a significant and different role than what the state does. So how does Logan City Council support ecosystem development? Um, we come at it in so many different angles. We come at it from the youth with um, a number of networks that we have, things like the Logan Education Roundtable with the principals of the state schools in, in Logan. We come at it from early stage startups with our Innovate Logan. It's a virtual innovation hub that was funded both from the Arab, from the Advancing Regional Innovation um, Program, along with council matched funding. So that's uh, you know a platform for young or early stage startups to to meet and all of that. Um, we also come at it from the late from the scale ups with our CoLab Growth Hub, which was established a couple of years ago. So we have you know residents, entrepreneurs, and residents there. We run portfolio programs for those companies that choose to go in there. Um, we also, we're very connected, we're very close to the community. So we connected with the Chambers of Commerce, there's three of them in Logan. Um, so we connected with them, obviously with the angel investors through Angel Loop. So it's, it's very much, we're so close to the community, we know what's going on, um, and we really build on networks <coughs> and collaboration as well as, of course, economic development through our Logan Office of Economic Development. We're very focused on our key industries and uh, also new and emerging industries. So, yeah, we come at it in, from many, many different angles. Mm -hmm. Lovely. And Scott, tell us what, given what you've heard yep. both today, what you know about us and what we're up to here in Queensland, and you know how ecosystems are built, give us your assessment of where we're at. Well, first, uh, thank you. okay, uh, simple question. Um, uh, first, um, first, um, along with my MIT colleagues, thank you so much uh, for hosting. I also want to acknowledge the land upon which we are meeting and also uh, pay respects to elders past, present, um, and emerging. And I will say, as somebody coming from the United States, we were fortunate enough to host uh, seven international teams along with our Perth team and the number of our um, uh, members from around the world who noted that, I think have observed the um, activity and commitment um, around uh, bringing a greater understanding between Aboriginal and Torres Straits Islanders and uh, broader Australia is really impressive to see. So thank you for uh, letting me have that experience as well. Um, as well, I want to thank uh, the Dean, the Vice Chancellor, the Minister, um, as well as all of you uh, for having us here. Thank you. Okay, on to question. Um, so, um, so the, so, on point, what I would say is that first, we were just so fortunate to have just an extremely ambitious, occasionally contentious, occasionally vigorous, uh, always vigorous um, Queensland team in REAP uh, from 2017 to 2019. And it was one of those teams where there had been many attempts, I think, to make things happen here. And there were already good things happening. This was not a place that was starting from nothing. There were already good things going on Advan under Arun and other <coughs> advanced uh, other uh, under government. Advanced Queensland was already moving forward, but you needed to do more and there was the ambition and uh, commitment to do it. And what I've been able just coming back today and even hearing all of you and catching up with some of you is to see a few key things. The first, 
ultimately innovation ecosystem work because of trust between stakeholders, because of the ability of people from different <coughs> organizations to both respect each other, to trust each other, and to gain shared assessment of joint purpose. And that is something that I saw all of today, and a commitment to overcoming some very natural, we all come from our own lens, we each are uh, 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 representing or found, or are the founders of different organizations with different needs. And so the first thing I see is that real commitment to both respect where you're coming from, but also to produce trust through joint activity. The second piece, and I, uh, I thought Yaz's yeah, comment was exactly uh, on point here, I think really seeing Queensland lean into what it's really good at, lean into its own identity, not simply be the next Silicon Valley, but instead be a better version and a growing version of Queensland, taking advantage of its diversity, taking advantage of its, um, bio, of its biodiversity, taking advantage of its location, its excellent universities, and the list goes on. And then the third, which maybe um, uh, um, I just you know, had the opportunity to meet with Georgie today and see the great work um, in Logan, and there we were sitting in a unicorn whose prior, there are not many unicorns whose prior instantiation as a company was, it was called Naughty and Nice Lingerie or whatever it might be. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes. Um, the, um, that's, a, that's a rare one in the, in the, in the startup cartography map. Um, the, uh, um, but it was really just great to see the energy and initiative in joint problem solving to really focus on important and critical issues facing Queensland's communities, facing its most central challenges at the macroeconomic level, but also those more local issues that need to be solved by local decision makers. So I can go on, and I will say the maybe last little piece of it is, um, and you know I, I, I would put this out, is that I also enjoyed, and I enjoyed in the minister's remarks, just also that you're counting it. So at MIT, we like numbers, yeah. and we like not just talking about programs, but tracking their impact both for the purposes of course correction. And so I think the great work and partnership between QT and government that's been around really seeing the impact and using that as a mechanism to drive change is really important and great seeing that accountability. Thank you. And we'll come back to that, that data question, but just Scott, can you continue on by just telling us a little bit about what the REAP framework looks like and why it's important? Just so you know, if you ask an academic to speak a second time, that's it, okay? <laughs> um, so, um, so the core of REAP, um, and I was you know, joking with the minister that I would say this, um, when we, uh, Josh Lerner, who had worked in this region, which I know a number of you know well, you know, Josh's early work on what was happening was everyone was trying to be the next Silicon Valley, and it wasn't working. And the question was, not a lot of the commentary to Josh's original work on Boulevard of Broken Dreams, give up. Maybe entrepreneurs will self-organize in Boulder, Colorado, occasionally, and otherwise, you can focus on other things, Minister, you're a busy person. Instead, a group of faculty members at MIT, myself, Fiona Murray, Bill Ouellette, got together and said, let us look at the root cause. Let us problem solve and understand what's going on. Why was there failure? among well-intentioned individuals to create this kind of change. And we really kind of synthesized that that came down to, first, no one is in charge of innovation or entrepreneurship. And that has many implications. There are many things in our classrooms to first approximation, we decide what the curriculum is. In your company, you get to decide what to call it, what it does, and you know, maybe the decisions are right or wrong and they're hard, but they're yours. No one is in charge of innovation or entrepreneurship. Our entrepreneurs are responsible for building their businesses, our innovators for bringing technology to scale. But government, corporates, university, and risk capital are enabling that process, but not in control of that process. And that means you have to take a stakeholder approach, but not just bringing people together, but gaining actual shared assessment. And some of that analytics that we sort of forced the REAP teams, I remember there was a few uh, quibbles around that, that's about gaining that shared trust and understanding the as a state, identifying latent strengths, a potential opportunity. But all the talk in the world, 
right? One of the things that I thank you again, both Dean as well as uh, Vice Chancellor, QUT, MIT, we are action-oriented schools. We love Harvard, Veritas Truth, <laughs> well, good, <laughs> okay? Men say modest, mind meets hand. It's, it's right in our logo. And that means we take that stakeholder approach, we take that shared assessment, and we turn it into action. And it was just incredibly just stimulating and really humbling to see the, the work and seriousness of purpose that the teams in Queensland Connects were bringing to that uh, today in Logan, both the Logan team as well as the others around the regions. Thank you, Scott. Um, and Wayne, we know Queensland is different to the other states. Not only is it geographically large, really large, with uh, quite significant differences as we move through the state from tropical to subtropical environments. We head west, it gets a heck of a lot drier or wetter, depending on the time of the year that we're in. A beautiful coast and, and people congregating along the coast. But we have as many people outside the southeast corner as we do inside the southeast corner. So this regional you know, we were in Western Australia last week. They're in Perth and there's a few people mm. outside of Perth. It's not like that in Queensland. So while we celebrate ecosystems, we also know that sometimes some things don't work. What works here won't work there. So Wayne, thinking about uh, Queensland, can we do the same things in regional Queensland as we do in the southeast corner? Why do we need to differentiate them? Yeah, I, so I agree with what Scott said, and that it really is about what's the opportunity, mm. what's the comparative advantage in each uh, in each area. And I think, why would you try and replicate something that you're not and miss out on the opportunity to capitalise on what you already are? And if I look across Queensland, the success that we've had, and the re, um, the Queensland Connects uh, teams that are that are here or online. Will, will absolutely know that their strength comes from from investing in more of what they're good at. Uh, I think, you know, I'm looking at Mike up there as the Director General responsible for state development and the strategy around um, building out our areas of strength. That makes sense. So we've, we've got an incredible agricultural industry. Why wouldn't we encourage the investment in innovation to make that even better? We've got an incredible resources industry. Why wouldn't we take that resources industry and make that globally competitive and make it greener? We've got incredible uh, natural assets. Why wouldn't we invest in renewable energy? And why wouldn't we help to build out uh, energy as a major economic driver for our state going forward and our investment in hydrogen? We've got incredible researchers in the southeast corner and also spread up the coast. Why wouldn't we try and commercialise more research locally and create more innovative companies locally and create more innovative jobs locally and produce more products and services that we export to the world? So, you know, we've got an emerging defence industry across a number of regions. We've got quantum computing. We've got all these unique advantages. Trying to uh, have every area fit into one box doesn't make sense. It makes a lot more sense. And, and quite frankly, as Scott said, there's no controlling element to the ecosystem anyway. Like me as a founder, I'm going to go and solve a problem that I care about. Yeah, and that's exactly what Yaz has done. And there are a number of founders in the room who are doing exactly that. And it just makes sense to, to build on our strengths and to therefore have a program or an ecosystem that unlocks that, that supports that, that encourages that, that accelerates that. And so I kind of think, you know, that's what, make Queens, that's what makes Queensland special. Uh, the fact that we are supporting the different areas of our state to capitalise on what we have the potential to be. Thank you, definitely. And Georgie, we've just been down in Logan um, and it has some unique advantages. What are those? Have, help people understand the piece that they drive past that will now stop at. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talk about geographically, obviously, we've got this central location between Brisbane, Gold Coast, Ipswich. So we're, we're in the centre. So hence, we do have a lot of logistics companies. We've got a lot of advanced manufacturing. Um, we've got um, a lot of health and social assistance. 
Um, so I think, yeah, geographically, we're, um, we're, we're well located. Um, we do want to continue to like sort of drive more high, um, you know, high um, value jobs in new and emerging industries. And we're doing that very well. I think we're very, we're very, very business orientated. So there's a lot of business in industry. There's 25,000 Logan ABN registered businesses in Logan, plus obviously the others that are there. And they're very focused, I think, because of our Logan Office of Economic Development, they know that they're supported by a council, um, A, to be innovative, um, B, to try things. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely the business industry factor, our central location, um, a very supportive council um, and organisation around innovation and entrepreneurship to just yeah, really support those companies. And so they, they feel it, you know, they feel the, the energy, they feel, they know the support is there, you know, um, it's lovely to hear Vu talk, you know, um, yeah, about, you know, staying in Logan when they could have chosen to, you know, have their head office anywhere else, but they're from Logan, that's their home, um, they're building there, um, or have built there and continue to build. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's, it's industry. And I think the other thing is because we're a little bit smaller, right, we're able to try things and do things. So we're a little bit, perhaps a little bit more agile as well. And of course, the other piece that you have is the multicultural. Uh, Absolutely. How could I forget? Yeah. <laughs> so perhaps tell people yeah. a little about that. Yeah. So in Logan, we've got 234 cultures that live in Logan. Um, we're one of the top 10 humanitarian settlement areas in Australia. We signed up to the Welcoming Cities Initiative to make to continue to make well, uh, Logan a welcoming place to live and prosper. So that is, um, yeah, that certainly is our makeup. You know, our makeup is very, very, very multicultural. And because it's been that way for a long time, therefore it's so natural to us as a council you know, John Raven and all our, you know, our other councillors, it's just part of who we are. We're just a multicultural community. So the project we've taken into Queensland Connects in Cohort 3 is how do we continue to help migrants and refugees um, sort of have an easier pathway to setting up businesses? We already know that they, they do that anyway, um, but yeah, we're very, very, very multicultural and we've got a very strong community development part within council because of because of the fact that they are there. So, yeah. And we had the pleasure this morning of hearing from Mo Azadea, who is a young man in grade 12 at Mabel Park State High School. He, he's he got a hustle like you would not believe. Um, he's established a number of ventures. He has a big agenda, uh, yeah, and he just epitomises that migrant family hustle mm. and the adoption of business mm. as a route into building economic future mm. and economic future in Australia. And I think if I could just add, I think because of some of those challenges we have in Logan, that's why things like the Logan Education Roundtable <laughs> stood up because we recognise the challenges that our students have. So they stood that up um, and honestly, they're just making so much headway um, to hear the president of the president, sorry, the principal of Logan Lee State High School, um, for them to change their, um, you know, their curriculum such that on a Wednesday it's called Future Future Anything, Future Wednesday, and those students get to trial different careers. And Brenton has already noticed at the end of term one, higher results from their students. Now it's not about, we know it's not about the results, but what it is, it's the engagement. It's the engagement of those students having more opportunities to try different careers, matching them up with industry. And yeah, he's starting to see those results. So it's really inspiring. Fantastic. And so we've heard about uh, a little bit about the way in which ecosystems operate, the fact that no one owns them, but we do know that entrepreneurs are at the center of them. And so the work that Brad Felds has done around startup communities and, and a bunch of others, we talk about entrepreneurs at the centre. Yes, do you feel as an entrepreneur that you have been 
at the centre. Personally, you have. <laughs> but do you feel as an entrepreneur you've been at the centre of the ecosystem here in Queensland? Look, I think absolutely in some ways. Uh, I'm the front row, shirt on, you know, pitching your pants off and really pushing yourself into all the spaces and places that you need to be, picking up the phone, connecting with anyone and everybody. And I think that's a big part of what Queensland op offers. That, Like I remember knocking on Don May's door because I'm Silvio's alumni and Domino's bought Silvio's. I was a delivery driver 30 years ago and I felt that it was my right to call Don and say, hey, can I, I just want to talk to you about my business. And I went and sat with him for an hour. And, and so I feel like, yes, entrepreneurs are at the centre but there's an energy and a, an essence of who you surround yourself with. And if you pick the right people, <coughs> you're like the nucleus of the cell and absolutely everybody else helps enable you. If you pick the wrong people, you die. And, and I have seen a number of entrepreneurs maybe um, surround themselves with perhaps not the best top five people that you should be hanging out with. And that's probably one of the hardest things as an entrepreneur, you come in, and you get mental whiplash and you embrace that. But if you then don't have the capacity and capability and belief within yourself to know when that mentor has served their time with you and it's your, you now have to move on. And it's not that you've outgrown them or that you're better or worse, but what you've needed to, to gain from that knowledge share has ended and it's your job now to start that again and again and again and again and it's a continuous improvement and I feel like you talked about agility before um, some of the feedback I've had from entrepreneurs over the years and now you, you've become an entrepreneur with say a brand like I have a brand my I'm in your face right and I'm un, un, unapologetic about that you, when you have no money you are your mouth is your money and you just have to push yourself out of your comfort zone and do what you have to do and stand on stage and do those things. But um, you don't do it on your own. So I feel a bit uncomfortable somewhat thinking that you're the centre of the ecosystem. But if you don't, I suppose, centre yourself with the fact that you are the centre of your own universe and your business will fail if you don't get up and get uncomfortable, but you actually must connect. And, and I know we've talked about Queensland Connects a little bit today, but it, it really is um, the biggest challenge, I think, for entrepreneurs is um, actually having the self-assurance to admit that they have to be the centre and to be the face, the brand and the, ev the chief everything officer of their enterprise. And if you aren't comfortable about that, then I see Angela nodding back there. Like BDO, I said to them long before Mark started there, I need an accountant that I'm not going to have to undo the work of in five years when my business is a success and I can't afford to pay you, but I need you to back me as a founder and BDO is still my client, like I'm still their client today and we pay them good money as we should be loyal and trustworthy to those people that believed in us. So yes, you're the centre, but you must also get out of your comfort zone and pick up the phone to the people who are actually those that will scale your business long before you realise that you need them. And it's a discomfort that you have to get comfortable with. Yeah, fantastic. Wayne? Yeah, I, I kind of think of it in a slightly different way uh, when we're talking about the entrepreneur at the centre of the ecosystem. Yeah, you know, if you think about what is the innate quality of an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur uh, is successful because they do something that helps. And in my mind, and the way I guess um, I've grown my businesses, uh, it's always been about being curious, being that curious problem solver, trying to identify where you fit and how you can add value <coughs> and how you can help. And by being, always asking how you can help, you're really what you're doing is you're building a brand and building a network just like Yaz has, based on delivering value. And it's that ability that, uh, it's the relationships you create by delivering value, by making a difference, that uh, creates that, for want of a better term, calm, that, that um, <clears throat> where there are other amazing people, and I can look around the room here and there are stacks of people in the room that I know have helped me build my businesses over the last 15, 20 years. And it's because I think I've tried to help as well, 
And I think one of the things about building a successful innovation ecosystem is creating an ecosystem where the participants actively try and be helpful. Yes. And I think if you look at what makes our ecosystem truly uh, unique, and you, know, you go back to Brad and what he's done in Boulder, or, you know, or, in, or written about what's happening in Boulder and other ecosystems that are truly powerful. Mm. It's a collection of people who, who truly try and help each other to be successful. Mm. And I think that comes if you play to your strengths, right? And so, yeah, yeah so. And, and one of the things I think, in extension to what you just said there, Wayne, is any time I've picked up the phone to somebody to ask for what I've needed, there's a confidence and competence that I will give back more than I will ever take. Absolutely. And so that is why I would ask, because I will bring more clients to BDO because of my advocacy, because I will support the ecosystem and other founders, because you champion the brands and the people that champion you, and it is very much about deposits and withdrawals in the bank account of love, in my opinion. And if you deposit more, you can make those withdrawals without any feeling of... Um, like you are taking. Thank you. And Sam, uh, in that work that Brad Feltz talked about, and, and Scott also referred to this in uh, in Josh Lerner's work around the pool of Marta Broken Dreams, government invested, no, it didn't work, therefore exit. We can't control it. And so often we get sense that um, governments, universities, corporates, that, <laughs> We've, we've built differently than an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial ventures, and we probably have more systems that are around controlling <laughs> rather than <laughs> giving and loosening. Yeah. How does how does Cisco deal with this, and how does Cisco engage with the ecosystem? Yeah, I will of course asking the thirty year PAYG guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, I think that's important. I mean, I, I know my place, you know, and um, I think as long as we don't stop at the self interest, because yeah. there's so much announced ecosystem creation and innovation, uh, startup enablement. Rand associations are very exciting for big corporates and universities uh, to be participating in that part of the economy. Mm. But we can often lose interest after the photograph's taken. And um, I, I think that um, if Cisco has done anything, it, it's understand its role in providing the enablement, the fertile ground, the, the support, support for Yaz and her business, you know, that, that um, we have always understood that the true uh, value will be created when a new business starts up or a more job ready student enters the workforce. You know, it, it, it has to go beyond the initial self interest of, you know, look at us backslapping and, and contributing. Uh, through collaboration partnerships. And, uh, yeah, that, that has been a, a sort of a real kind of observation I've made is there are people who are really in there, uh, really in there for the long haul, and there are those who are there for the, you know, for the photos. Oh, photos. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. And yes, at Cisco and Data3, mm -hmm. the work that you do to support women in technology, the scholarships, the internships that you offer, uh, all about creating that ecosystem. True value. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and Wayne, in your role as Chief Entrepreneur, you did a lot around trying to unlock government and the role of government, because one of the key things that government can do is procure from entrepreneurial ventures, both stimulate innovation, but procure. Tell us a bit about that work. One of my favourite sayings is customers, not grants. Yes. Right. Customers uh, force early stage companies to build true muscle. The muscle around how to tender, how to have a great product that actually meets the service expectations and the support expectations of a customer. The muscle to have in place the governance and the discipline and all the things necessary to, to become that uh, scalable organization which is a true contributor to the economy by creating lots of high paying jobs. Uh, government is the biggest employer in Queensland and the biggest business ultimately in Queensland. And 
it makes sense to have access um, for early stage companies to government as a customer. You know, I was lucky when I found in my company, my first customer was BHP. You know, and having BHP as a first customer teaches you really, really valuable lessons. And so I look to government. 80 days net. No, I was lucky. It was uh, 14 back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got an engineering company. We know that line too. Um, yeah, government has the opportunity to solve so many really, really important problems. And it is at the centre of every one of our emerging industry strategies. Every emerging industry is uh, really unlocked through innovation. That's what differentiates emerging industries. And so I think. Uh, innovative companies partnering with government to create innovative industries is absolutely key to Queensland's future. We have um, one of the things I was most excited about as chief entrepreneur, and I did that role for 18 months, was the calibre of the people in government. Government has a bad brand when it comes to uh, its people, and it's so entirely unfair and untrue. Now, I, I, did, I ran workshops with central procurement teams, you know, like two and three day workshops. We ran enormous amounts of programs through government. And there are so many genuinely innovative people that want to partner with local organisations. They truly are problem solvers. And I think the ability to unlock them as a customer is what will absolutely accelerate our economy. Okay, now I did promise that you asked some questions. Do we have any hands up for a question? Of course, we've got a run <laughs> hand up. I think uh, we've got a mic coming right now down to a run. Thank you very much. <coughs> so I have a question for Scott. Uh, I think uh, Wayne uh, obviously said that trying to find strengths in this. We're not trying to be a silicon man. Um, but you always sort of said, what is your home run? And from the very early days of the game, we did foresee that in resources, in agriculture, in mining, this is the best domain knowledge that is available in the and we should be able to take advantage of that. One of the challenges, say with the mining sector, is that it's a mature industry. And especially in the resources <coughs> with fossil fuels, it also is a declining industry. And Wayne will tell you the difficulty of selling into a mining company. The traditional service providers of knowledge intensive services become the gatekeepers. So an entrepreneur is must be lucky to get to the mining company directly. They have to go via these other service providers. Right. Now, this is where how we figure out a sunrise industry where Queensland is going to be one of the great superpowers, where those traditional gatekeepers still don't know how to figure this out, and that's green hydrogen. Green hydrogen, no one exactly knows what kind of knowledge intensive solutions around safety, around distribution, around like you know different use cases. So as this industry is growing from zero dollars in revenue to perhaps $50 billion eventually in 20 years, 30 years to take over from LNG and co. How we create opportunities for our entrepreneurs to work with the investment that will come in and that will be project investment, but how it grows an ecosystem. And it's not going to happen in Houston because they are going to be focused on blue hydrogen. It's not going to happen in Middle East. They simply import talent. Queensland has this opportunity. So do you see examples where an ecosystem of entrepreneurs grew with a sunrise industry that went from zero to $50 million? Okay. My mistake for asking a professor <laughs> 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 rather than giving a statement. <laughs> so, professor. Okay, a absolutely. And anyone who else wants to join in, um, so, so um, certainly no. no. Um, so, a few pieces. So first, thank you, Arun. It's been a while since I've seen you and I've missed, missed, missed those penetrating questions. Um, <laughs> the, so I think the question, you know, is green hydrogen, is that a big bet for Queensland? How do you make that happen? And I would highlight a few things. 
I think that green hydrogen is a very strong area that has potential, but no guarantees. It's not the risk yet, it's not scaled. But that, but no one owns it. And so that has the feature that many of the processes, much of the expertise, many of the capabilities that are, if it's going to work out, that is a trajectory of activity which Queensland can both leverage, but even more importantly, shape. So in other words, green hydrogen is not going to happen just because. Human beings are going to have to, in some location, some confederation of companies are going to have to do the work to go from the laboratory or very prototype <clears throat> test to the kind of scaling that you're talking about. Two little pieces around that. First, I wanted to double down. This is an area where Wayne's first customer type thinking is really important. This is an opportunity for government and for big corporates to work with groups who are seeking, you know, if I'm, I'm a big company, I'd like to be more sustainable than I currently am. Green hydrogen is a bet, but if I can work and be the first customer for those entrepreneurs, whether or not it's tier one supplier or, you know, main firm that we could do for another day, but I think that's a tremendous opportunity. The second point, though, is I think to Arun, is the value of experimentation and learning at the ecosystem level. So I said this when I was down at Go One today, is, you know, you know, they are justly, I guess, celebrated for going and, right, locating in a, you know, right, place that you wouldn't expect a unicorn. And they did it for their own reasons. But boy, have they made it dramatically easier for the next startup founder to have a reason to locate there. One, because their own employees are probably going to be spinning out companies. And because all of a sudden there's an in fact ecosystem building in a place that previously wouldn't have that tech oriented uh, focus. So I just think that the, the value of experimentation learning and in a more exploratory approach at this stage really can set the stage for building that critical mass. There's going to be some de risking. I'm sure there are people much more expert on the mechanics of green hydrogen, but I think that it's a worthy kind of running out that string is a the kind of invest uh, sort of tailored exploratory investment that kind of builds on local strength. Okay, I'm really hesitant. Is there a really <laughs> short question? <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> All right, a lot of the discussion has been um, focused naturally enough, I guess, on startups and uh, you know, small scale entrepreneurship. Um, what, what reflections has the panel got on the innovation and entrepreneurship that happens in a corporate setting? Mm. Um, how are its characteristics different? What might government do differently to encourage that, given that uh, we don't really mind where the innovation comes from? Yeah. I, have, I have a comment on that, you can go. Um, yeah. and I'll be concise. Um, <laughs> we have a formula, actually, in our business. So I was an entrepreneur. I used to install and supply all this technology <coughs> to universities when I was at Video Pro, and, um, and I needed to break free from being an entrepreneur, but I got to see a lot of innovation. There's a really good book called The Three Box Solution. It's a high recommendation for in innovation within a corporate. But as a founder, we raised $4 million in four weeks um, with Officeworks being a key investor. Um, and so what we're seeing is this significant trend around innovation almost being um, partnership oriented for big businesses because they are, and so the formula is agility, us, plus stability, them, equals capability. And so for them to go as fast as they need to, for big corporates to go as fast as they need to, they're buying in businesses like ours. And, and we're very publicly um, proud of the fact that Officeworks own 21% share of our company now. Um, it's going to help us scale, but what we bring to them is significantly more than the investment that they invested into us because it's speeding up the velocity and capability of their internal systems, their staff, and we're seeing that incubation of entrepreneurship as a 
almost a circular product that's going back into those ecosystems. eBay Ventures just invested in a, a startup in Western Australia, also funded by a female founders program. And we're seeing that happening because they've got the capability and the capacity financially to be able to go faster than they would by trying to invent that internally themselves. Sam, any comments? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, you know, Cisco's been through the whole the whole journey. I think uh, our best method is to make sure we have enough money to buy the innovation um, <laughs> from the market to let the startup community and the agility of entrepreneurship flourish, and then snuffable life out of it. But um, that, that, that being said. Uh, there is no doubt that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from, you know, Bezos's pizza box innovation and Procter and Gamble. Um, there is, there is all sorts of cultural requirements, and uh, I think it's a important point. Look, we could we could talk all evening. We got nowhere near the end of the questions that I had, and I know that there are a lot more around the role of innovation ec ecosystems, the role that each of the players in the ecosystem play. And also what we didn't get to is around the inclusivity of others in the ecosystem. We know that there is work that we need to continue to do around females and their participation in the ecosystem, around First Nation uh, individuals and businesses and as the work at Logan is all about around migrants as well. So there are many who, you know, we like to say the ecosystem, we're here to support entrepreneurs, but we have to be quite conscious in the way in which we open up and engage everyone in the ecosystem. Before you stop, because forgiveness over permission. Um, <laughs> as a female founder, I didn't realise I was a female founder when I first came into the ecosystem, and I didn't know that only 2% of funding globally from venture capitalists comes to female founded ventures. What I want to leave the room with today is a different narrative. Okay. <laughs> Female-led ventures return 36% higher returns than their male-led counterparts. Let's talk up, on, forward, motion rather than this woe is me i'm a female founder i'm so disadvantaged the more we sell that story the more we're going to suck so can we sell the story of 36 percent higher returns than their male adventures let's leave with that Join me in thanking our panel, Yaz, Georgie, Sam, Wayne, and Scott. I think Cal. Thanks so much, Rowena, Yaz, Georgie, Sam, Wayne, and Scott, for your contribution to the conversation this afternoon about building innovative ecosystems. Um, we have a small token of appreciation for each of you um, that's going to be handed out to you very, very shortly. Um, QT's partnership with MIT is one of global connectivity, academic and student collaboration and industry partnerships. So as you may have seen for the past few days, uh, we've been delighted to host our friends and colleagues from MIT Sloan School of Management here at QUT. Um, so now I'm very delighted to introduce to the stage, to provide the vote of thanks, Mr. David Capitolupo, Assistant Dean Global Programs from MIT Sloan School of Management. DCAP, as he is fondly referred to, <laughs> is responsible for global partnerships such as the one with QUT and the delivery of MIT's Regional Entrepreneurship Acceleration Program, REAP, that you've been hearing about this afternoon, and also Sloan's Visiting Fellows Program. So please welcome David. <laughs> Well, it's befitting. So this is actually my last night in your country and in Queensland, because I go back to the States uh, tomorrow with uh, Aaron and Stu, my colleagues. It's Sloan, and um, I can't think of a better way to end our time here with this panel today. This is just amazing. So like you, I travel a lot. And like all of us, I have little rituals. And one of my rituals I'm going to share with you. And when I get on the plane, I think, well, let me look at all the movies 
I look at the movies that I'm going to watch, and then I think I could do some emails, but I'll save that for maybe the eighth hour of the flight. And then I look at the menu, and then one ritual I have is I think of any cultural things that I um, never knew before that I tried. And I have three that I'm going to share with you. The first one is I went to my first rugby game. No, rugby league. <laughs> right? And my team won. <laughs> and the only reason, it's not because they wore the scarf, but I, I, I chose a scarf because of the colors. It reminded me of MIT colors. I was very happy about that. So that was wonderful. Um, so that was great. Um, the second one, um, Amanda, I tried Vegemite for the first time this morning. Oh. <laughs> Stu was my witness. I loved it. Oh. Um, I will admit the salt has quite a punch. <laughs> But I, it had a smoky flavor, and I've already thought of <coughs> recipes for New England. So if there are any female founders who'd like to work with me, and any VC and PE people at the reception, I already have a cookbook and a TV show that I would like to invest in. So see me afterwards. And Tim Tams are dangerous. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about Tim Tams. Um, but that, that's kind of the humorous part of this, but it's true, Those, that is my ritual, and you're part of it. Um, but I will say, on a more serious note, uh, the MIT relationship with QUT is the very heart and essence of entrepreneurship and innovation. And it was cohort five, right, that um, Queen Liz was part of, and we're on cohort 10 right now. So that shows you um, the number of years we've had this relationship together. And I'm honored to say that I was part of the negotiations um, which resulted on where we are here today. And while applications like WebEx and Zoom kept us connected, to be in person like this um, for a live webinar um, with stakeholders like the Queensland government, um, Cisco, MIT staff and faculty, honored guests, and most of all, of course, our colleagues at QUT. Um, this is not just a special day for our collaboration, but I wrote down an important one. And conversations whilst here with our QUT friends on the past couple of days um, have focused on how we can not only teach and educate the principles of entrepreneurship innovation, but how our institutions um, along with our valued stakeholders, can be entrepreneurial and innovative ourselves. Um, we have similar DNA. And if our respective mission and vision statements do guide us, we have serious, impactful, and gratifying goals ahead of us. So on behalf of all of us at MIT, we look forward to our journey together and thank you for everyone here for making our stay uh, most memorable. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Well, you're a true honorary Aussie now that you've, <laughs> you've embraced Vegemite. Uh, thank you also to Scott and to Stu and to Erin um, for the trip here. I know you've still got some more work to do out, out at Longreach, so um, for some of you who are staying on for a little longer, so um, I hope you enjoy your trip. We're thrilled to have you here to see the Queensland ecosystem at work. Um, thanks again to all of our speakers on the panel, also to um, uh, the Minister Hinchcliffe who was here earlier, um, to our Vice-Chancellor and to our Cisco partners, uh, Sam and Terry. We really value the relationship that we have with Cisco. And of course, to our innovation leaders, Wayne Gerard, Yaz Gugolinas, and Georgie Major, who spoke earlier. Uh, and of course, big thank you to Professor Rowena Barrett, who drives a lot of what we're doing here. And to that end, I'd also like to thank the Innovation Central Brisbane team, Kathy McKay uh, from QUT Entrepreneurship, uh, who produced today's event. And to Gemma Ackler, where are you, Gemma? Honestly, the heart and soul of a lot of what we do here as well. Thank you also, guests, colleagues, friends of QUT and the broader ecosystem for your time, your curiosity and your contribution to this afternoon. If you'd like to um, listen back to previous 
webinars, uh, we've got a QR code on the screen that you can scan. Um, I'd also like to invite you now to rejoin us in the foyer for some light refreshments. Thank you uh, and safe travels home everybody, particularly those who are heading back to Boston. <laughs> Thank you.